focus your efforts on creating an optimal farrowing crate environment, which means again, that's warm, that's clean, it's dry and draft free, and focus on individual sow and piglet care before redirecting your efforts to drying pigs at birth. We all know you're gonna have some crates that we simply can't fix, and it will remain necessary to keep drying those pigs and providing supplemental heat. But focus your efforts again on those temperature, feed, water, air, the basics of animal husbandry. Welcome to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine nutrition research digested for you. I'm your host, Clayton Chastain, and today we have with us Dr. Ashley DeDecker, the Senior Director of Production Research and Extension at Smithfield. So Ashley, it's been a little while since you've been on the show. So before we begin, could you remind the audience a little bit about your background? Of course. I have worked in research for Smithfield for 13 years, and that research brings me down several different paths of sow care, guilt development, nutrition, welfare, animal health, meat quality, anything and everything that has to do with raising a pig. Uh, So there's always something new and exciting coming down the path, but my job is to answer those questions objectively to help make better business decisions for Smithfield. Awesome. So I wanted to talk about a topic that is arguably one of the more important topics within the area of swine production. um, And it's also very frequently talked about. Um, and that's day one pig care. I, people always say, and it's a very common phrase, that getting those pigs started off right is one of the most important things you can do because that'll really set the stage, if you will, for their performance for the entirety up through marketing. Um, so I guess to start, why is day one pig care as important as it is? And what have you guys done in terms of research at Smithfield uh, behind day one pig care? First of all, we're going to start all the way back at the beginning with newborn day one pig care. And a lot of times that comes to right at the very beginning when those piglets are born. And there's been, we know, newborn piglets experience a a rapid decrease in body temperature immediately after birth, which obviously increases the risk of mortality. So our goal is provide a warm, comfortable microenvironment that reduces that risk for them. But there's been a lot of external research, and it's, it's really hard to identify if how much we're doing to increase that body temperature actually has an impact on survival of that piglet. And so what we wanted to do in Smithfield is say, okay, we're drying pigs, but hey, we're comparing different drying agents. There's of course tons of different powders. There's towel drying. Which drying agent is better? And is it towel drying is better than a drying agent? So we did all of these comparisons. And after numerous trials across the U.S. kind of said that, hey, no method or product for drying pigs is really better than another, whether you're using a towel or whether you're using dual dry or lime or any drying agent, they all perform relatively very similar to each other. But what surprised us by far the most in all of those trials is that we had a true control, which we all have in our farms, which means that we simply didn't dry the piglet at all when they were born. And what we learned from that is that drying pigs at birth does improve piglet survival, but only when the farrowing crate environment is suboptimal. So what is suboptimal in that case, or what is optimal farrowing crate? So a suboptimal farrowing crate means that we still need to dry those pigs. That's when a farrowing crate is cold, it's damp, it's dirty, it's drafty. And these issues cannot be fixed prior to farrowing. So that's considered a suboptimal environment for newborn pigs. And in those cases, the litter must be dried at birth to improve chance of piglet survival. So what we learned from this is reprioritize, refocus our efforts to make sure that each farrowing crate needs to be clean, warm, dry, draft free prior to that sow farrowing. So fix those drafts if you have some. Um, Set your farrowing room temperatures according to your farm protocol. Make sure your supplemental heat sources, like your pads, your mats, your lamps, are in place and are working properly. Make sure that creep area is above 90 degrees. And when your farrowing crate environment is optimal, there's no benefit to drying pigs at birth. And it's considered to be an advanced care option. So I think that's the really the main takeaway here is overall, focus your efforts on creating an optimal farrowing crate environment, which means, again, 
that's warm, that's clean, it's dry and draft free, and focus on individual sow and piglet care before redirecting your efforts to drying pigs at birth. We all know you're going to have some crates that we simply can't fix, and it will remain necessary to keep drying those pigs and providing supplemental heat. But focus your efforts again on those temperature, feed, water, air, the basics of animal husbandry. Gotcha. So you've talked a little bit about maximizing the quality, if you will, of that micro environment, such as looking at if there are any drafts, if there's a, too low of a temperature. Um, but when kind of looking at those variables, did you notice any that have a larger impact than others or are more important than others to focus on in terms of um, maximizing that space in order to not chill the pigs if they're not dried? What we were able to measure in the study is because we had sensors throughout the fairing room and we were able to block them into, let's say, optimal or suboptimal temperatures and understand what that curve was and see when we saw benefit from the treatments being applied of drying or not drying pigs. And so it kind of goes back to all the basics of provide a proper heat source, make sure it's a clean, dry environment. Are the fans, if you are using fans, are they not tilted down? They're directed the right way. We'll focus on keeping those pigs warm and in that time period. And in case, this case also led us down to another question of going back to where are all of our monitors spending their time? What are they focusing? What are they spending their time? If you ask them, they're spending a lot of time walking, walk, just walking in general from fairing crate to fairing room. But another thing is split suckling. And thinking about what what is split suckling? Where did it come from and, and why do we do it? And so I had to remind myself and go back and say, because I've heard of so many different split suckle protocols, say, what is the traditional split suckling? And it's removing the larger firstborn piglets that have already ingested that colostrum, allowing the smaller later born piglets access to the udder without competition. And so you heard some protocols that, hey, um, switch them out twice, give every single pig opportunity to suckle undisturbed because we assume that more colostrum ingested should result in better chance of survival. Theoretically, it all makes sense. It makes logical sense to me. I've been a firm believer in split suckling because logically it, it makes perfect sense, right? Well, as I started to search into the literature on this one again, I found 12 publications um, that were assessing survival or average daily gain from 1985 to 2023. Out of those 12 publications, two of them showed an improvement from split suckling on either survival or average daily gain. The other 10 either showed no benefit whatsoever or even a negative consequence to doing this. So I was really baffled. I was like, so why did this become an industry's wide practice? And looking back of when split suckling came around, it was really kind of marketed as a logical management strategy or technique for weaning more pigs from the hyper prolific sow. We had large born alive, but not as many functional teats. And it made logical sense. And the research back then really supported it and did show that there was benefit. So we ended up doing three different trials, trying to prove ourselves wrong again, because again, I was a believer. I believe in split suckling. I would go on a farm and say, hey, how are you doing this? Let's not keep them in a tote too long, but let's make sure we got a heat source on them. Um, but after doing three trials across different states in the U.S., different techniques, we were not able to find any benefit on survival or growth when we were split suckling. And when we really dug down into it, we wanted to know who's being impacted. Is it those smaller? Is it those later born piglets that we're really trying to help? And what we found out is that sometimes those smaller, later born pigs aren't taking the opportunity to actually utilize that time and get suckling. And in fact, what we're doing is we're providing a hindrance and we're actually compromising those larger pigs that were isolating in a tote. In fact, it doubled their mortality by isolating them in that tote. So even though we're trying to do good, and we may have done some good to those little guys, but the bad we just did to those larger pigs outweighs what benefit we are trying to do. So again, I don't think this is a, I don't think we've been doing it wrong for the last 20, 30 years. I think that the sow today, genetically, she's different. Back then, she probably couldn't nurse 
the highly prolific, high born alive piglets that she had. But today our teat counts are up. And if we give her the op- opportunity to, to nurse and get the colostrum in those pigs with proper cross fostering and matching the functional teat count, she probably has a better opportunity to keep those pigs survival versus trying to compromise or isolate those larger born pigs. So I don't want to say we've been doing it wrong for the past 20, 25 years. It, it all made sense. The literature was there. It's just today, Sal, she's she's a different being. And she's a highly productive. She's got more functional teeth that she can do it on her own if we just give her the chance. Through nutritional strategies, management strategies, we have better ways of improving our environment for those piglets. That if we just there provide the basic care of feed, water, make sure the environment's right, give them a chance to do what they need to do. So that gives us a time to redirect our time, our labor, right? We're all short labor. That's a constant problem. So how do we prioritize and refocus or redirect our time that we were splint drying pigs or split suckling and focus on what are your key performance indicators that you really need help with? Maybe I have a high late on. Well, let's turn ourselves into pig savers and like let's listen for those pigs that are potentially getting laid on or meeting our timely rounds. If we're not getting there every 20 to 30 minutes, let's focus on that. Or again, providing that clean, dry, warm, bearing crate for every single litter. Refocus our priorities onto where our KPIs tell us that we should be focused on. And take those advanced care options for after we get the basics, the basic foundation of animal care, correct. Wisenetics turns podcast airtime into brand authority. We don't sell ads, we elevate voices. Curious how far your voice can go to become a reference in the industry and attract more leads? Scan the QR code and discover how we can turn your expertise into unmatched brand authority. Let's transform expertise into influence, starting now. So I've actually heard from some other people who some of their research has hypothesized that the modern sow, with us producing as many pigs per sow per year as it does, um, may very possibly not even produce enough colostrum in order to support the number of pigs that it has. And you, I know that you've talked about how sometimes those little pigs don't necessarily take advantage of the opportunity that's given to them when split suckling is utilized. But do you think it also could be a factored in that there might not be any colostrum left over, depending on how much those uh, larger pigs have eaten before they've been removed from the sow? Or do you think it's solely because those little pigs are not um, making the most of the opportunity of the time window that they have in order to drink that colostrum that's on the sow? I think, I I don't really know. I don't know if they're producing enough colostrum, but we saw in different situations where some of the smaller later born pigs would take the opportunity to suckle. And it's up to us to encourage that suckling behavior as well. But other ones were just resting and getting warm still. And so at the end of the day, we're isolating all the larger ones and those smaller ones, some of them may have had an advantage from it and it may have helped them and other ones didn't take the opportunity. But what is consistent is that we are isolating those larger pigs. And I think that's more of the concern is that we're doing more damage than we are good in the sense of our larger, bigger pigs. But I can't answer the question of, is our sow producing enough colostrum to support the litters that she's producing today. I I wish I had some of that information and measuring immunocrit over time would have been a a great way to try to answer that. Yeah. I mean, I can understand your point too with those large pigs, because when you get a hundred percent higher mortality, when you introduce split suckling on the ones that you pull off, it's kind of hard to justify the fact that you would be able to recoup that economic loss just for the benefit that you get from the small pigs if you really get much of a benefit at all. Because it sounds like you weren't even getting one, but with a 100% higher mortality, I mean, that's quite significant. So um, I definitely understand your point there. But I believe that's all the time we have, Ashley. So thank you again for coming on the show and sharing all this data with us. Yep, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you as always, Clayton. Yeah, and you've definitely given a lot of the listeners something to think about in terms of the different practices they use on day one pig care. But to everyone else, thank you for listening to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. Please visit us at swinenutritionblackbelt.com. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast channel so you won't miss out on the next episode. See you next week.